and welcome back. And this is our final panel of the day. And today I'm joined by Nikolai Klimenyuk. I think I've pronounced that correctly, hopefully. <laughs> and we've got Operator Starsky, who needs no introduction. I think you'll all be familiar with his incredible materials. This large, this last panel is going to be about how Russia weaponizes everything, including information, memory, and politics. Now, that's a huge subject. We will uh, see if we can exhaust the topic. That means we'll be here for the next 24 hours. Now, seriously, this is going to last about an hour or so. We'll see how far we go. And um, it's going to be more of a discussion because I think this is a topic that, uh, that we go into a lot of depth. But we have someone here who, of course, has been on the front line of Russian disinformation and is now dedicating his time to fighting it, which is our Operator Starsky. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But let's, talk, let's start about some of the origins of Russian disinformation and the paranoia that sits behind it. And of course, it's not just about narratives, it's also about technology. So when the Xerox came into being, that was seen as an incredible threat to the Soviet regime. You needed a permit to actually access this because information is power, information is a threat. And we now see that same paranoia being projected onto the new technology of the internet. And rather than being seen as a benign uh, instrument for human progress, uh, in the paranoia of the Kremlin, it's seen as a CIA and Western plot. So I'd like to throw that out first, uh, this idea about narrative requiring technology and technology being a threat to totalitarian regimes. Nikolai, let's chuck that one over to you for starters. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I've heard the question, but yeah, I'm, um, let's say, I. I think disinformation is just one part of the problem and I don't think it's even the the biggest and the uh, most dangerous one because well it's uh, it's about uh, manipulation it's about spreading confusion and uh, honestly speaking uh, disinformation and all those manipulative techniques they don't work very well in in a sound and healthy environment. So they mostly relate to, uh, um, to pre-existent um, problems. And yeah, we see, we see it in Germany. Germany, um, German parts of the German population, parts, parts of the German society are highly susceptible to, uh, to manipulations. But not all of those manipulations are really disinformation. Um, you've been already discussing things like um, the narrative of Ukraine being a highly corrupt country, for example. Well, there is corruption in Ukraine. This, the, the, the question is not, uh, um, is not if you are lying about it. The, the question is how you frame it. And... Um, yeah, the main spreaders of uh, you know pro-Russian narratives or uh, narratives that are helping uh, Russia are not necessarily Russian uh, internet trolls or Russian propaganda uh, outlets. These are German politicians, for example, or these are German pundits um, on the telly or. Uh, you know, editors at uh, uh, public broadcasters who invite people like that and let them uh, uh, let them spread the bullshit. <laughs> That's an interesting point. There, I'll, I'll send that over to you, uh, Mr. Sarsky. So, the suggestion here is that this kind of propaganda will always exist as long as there are malign actors, but actually the onus needs to shift on those who are supposedly responsible owners of the media and those who are receiving the information to perhaps become more adept at questioning and de you know, deconstructing what they're receiving uh, to be perhaps a little more cynical. 
Uh, well, I think first option is uh, will be more uh, effective because uh, we always talk about uh, the need to educate people, to uh, teach them how to uh, do fact check, and etc., etc. But it's something that people should know by by default, right? Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, add something to um, uh, to the uh, opinion. Uh, uh, said by, by uh, Nikolai. Um, so uh, it's not like uh, there is uh, some part of uh, audience that is uh, more susceptible to the uh, Russian propaganda, some of them are less. Um, everything starts at basic PR. According to the basic PR, uh, every uh, sort of your uh, informational operation must be uh, aimed at some specific uh, target audience. And uh, this is what Russians do perfectly. They know how to work with the target audiences that uh, may benefit uh, their interests, that may be more susceptible to their agenda. Uh, that's why they're targeting uh, specific groups of people, men, women, uh, different age categories, uh, different, uh, let's say, faith categories, religions, uh, etc., etc. And uh, this works because Russians basically invented propaganda. People who say that uh, there's propag propaganda on the West, you know, they don't realize that uh, Russians invented the, 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 the mechanism of propaganda back in the times of the Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, it was so much effective, so Stalin, um, in the end, had to eliminate the professional revolutionaries because uh, they are um, not their ideas, but their skills uh, were dangerous for the Communist Party. They were dangerous for the uh, existence of the Soviet uh, Union, so uh, he had to have them eliminated. Um, and. Um, Speaking of the danger that uh, the modern technologies pose to uh, to the existing regime in Russia, well, we basically can see from the news that Russians are uh, blocking different uh, resources. Uh, two years ago, they blocked um, Facebook, Instagram for being extremist. Uh, recently, there are news that uh, they were gonna block. Um, Steam, which is a gaming platform for, for millions of Russians who like, who like to play games, again, because Steam does not correspond to the standards uh, made by the Roscom Nadzor. Uh, so we can see that uh, they're um, cutting all the channels that can, can be potentially used uh, against the Russian regime, but at the same time, it, so, some of those decisions are completely ridiculous like Instagram, like uh, Steam, uh, I, think, I think it's kind of funny. But uh, on the other hand, of course, they, they might have uh, true reasons to, to do that because they're thinking like uh, basically like, like partisans because Russians are uh, par partisans in the in internet warfare and they're using boat I'm farms. I'm really glad you used this word because I was thinking of partisans in a, in a, in a different context. Yeah, and, and, uh, and they realize that uh, commentaries, even in the discussion under some game releases on Steam, they may be dangerous because uh, people can freely post their ideas there and uh, it can be used against the regime. There is one thing, if I may, uh, which I would like to add to what you've just said. And this is, um, yeah, about, you know, old Bolsheviks. It was not only that they were masters of propaganda, they were um, organizing themselves in exile. And they're very efficient at that. And so the Russian, the Soviet, in, in this case it was the Soviet uh, repressive machine and the Soviet uh, propaganda machine was firing from all, you know, weapons against um, uh, against emigres. So they did everything to discredit the very idea of a successful political fight from uh, abroad, from mostly from Europe. And we see how it works uh, uh, until now. So the uh, uh, Russian political immigrants are actually uh, absolutely disoriented and they don't 
really know what can, what they can do from abroad. So they just you know, okay, we don't have a moral, uh, you know, right to to tell the people what to do. Hmm. Yeah, okay, we can't organize them uh, in the West because, well, uh, we are in safety and they are not, and we can't do that uh, in Russia because uh, uh, because it's too dangerous and so on and so forth. So this is this is actually also an element of Russian propaganda. So it. Uh, this, this great narrative uh, prevents successful political uh, opposition operating um, from the West. And I don't want to twist the conversation and, and, and focus on Navalny because that's a, an insult to, to, to uh, a Ukrainian guest here to bring the, you know, take the oxygen up with that. But this seems to have influenced his thinking to go back. This very thing that you've mentioned there, I can't be an effective political operator in the West. I have to go back and be there. There may be other things going on as well, but this seems to have, have played into that mm. decision making. Not strategically, the best decision probably. Mm. Uh, I, I, I don't think this is the, uh, this was the worst uh, decision, <laughs> decision ever is made. Uh, the problem, the basic problem uh, with all major opposition uh, figures in Russia that the war and the uh, militarism, the uh, uh, aggressive character of Russia never played a role. When we are speaking about Navalny in his uh, uh, 2017 presidential program, there were two men, one mentioning of Ukraine that we should normalize uh, the relationships and the uh, uh, one mentioning of Crimea, uh, uh, um, this uh, should be, th this question should be decided by the Crimean uh, inhabitants. That's it. Uh, uh, and, and this is also one of the bigger uh, bigger differences between you know the um, the old school Bolsheviks and the more current Russian positions. The Bolsheviks they had ideas and they uh, saturated uh, Russia, the Russian Empire, uh, with those ideas. Uh, Russian current Russian opposition doesn't have any ideas. They you know imagine. Uh, uh, some kind of better Russia without Putin, without uh, corruption, but this is the same, uh, the same old Russia, which is a, uh, an existential threat to, to Ukraine, to any neighboring country, to the world, to whatever. This is a, an evil uh, um, colonial empire. Um, so this is the problem. And the decision to go back to Russia, which was tactically not very wise and fatal uh, in this case, was part of this uh, of the thinking, was not surprising at all. And so fighting essentially a psychopathic killer and his enablers with information is potentially not going to work here. I use this as an example of you know, coming to a knife fight with a spoon. You're, you're not going to come off too well in that instance. Um, does Ukraine give us a template for how this kind of uh, m regime with murderous intent need to be tackled? We have the Orange Revolution and then we have Maidan, where people are prepared to use violence to resist violence and to survive. I mean, is, is that perhaps more of a template for how to resist rather than this sort of you know, informational uh, warfare? Uh, so the events in Ukraine during the Revolution of Dignity uh, demonstrated that it's really hard to fight uh, using democratic measures, democratic tools, in a country that is ruled by a regime that despises democracy, where democracy simply doesn't work. And this is when you definitely have to use force uh, in order to uh, reach your goals. And uh, the goal in Ukraine, uh, the, the, the whole goal of the uh, Revolution of Dignity was uh, removing the dictator, removing the uh, pro-Russian influence in Ukraine and um, conducting democratic elections, which was done. Uh, a lot of people uh, who say that uh, it, it was a coup and everything else, they don't understand that the result of this uh, revolution was uh, democratic elections of government and president and since that time we had several elections and uh, basically ukrainian revolution 
apparently was uh, the only revolution in the Eastern Europe that actually was successful uh, comparing to what happened in Belarus, what uh, happened several times in uh, Russia. Uh, Georgia. The, Georgia, Georgia is still yeah. sort of holding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, this is why even uh, when we talk about the uh, Russian oppositionists who say that uh, Ukrainian uh, way is not our way, like, like Max Katz, for example, we should not listen to Ukrainians because this is not our way. Uh, well, I think that they really should do that because uh, our revolution was successful. Uh, and uh, we managed to remove the dictator that was uh, killing our citizens. And uh, basically, even though he was also democr like democratically elected because he falsified, uh, the, he forged uh, elections several times, uh, but uh, still, uh, he uh, um, basically betrayed the idea of being a president who guaranteed uh, things like Ukrainian language, who guaranteed the integrity of the Ukrainian state, who uh, uh, in invented the not invented but uh, implemented this uh, informational campaign that split Ukraine in three categories, uh, different sorts of people, which was insane, um, and uh, it was. It, Ukrainian revolution was a success in the end. And this is an interesting one because uh, this, this mythology that Russia is unique, Russia is distinct, Russia has to have its own way, it cannot learn from other political processes in other countries, you might think that that is something that, that, that has been spread under Putinism. But I heard this same idea in the 90s and it set off some alarm bells. I thought this is, and everyone is saying this to me, and it's as if everyone's watched an advert, as everyone's watched the same strap line, as if it's been coded into their heads. I wonder whether that idea dates back maybe into the, the Bolshevik period. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that mm -hmm. because, well, uh, you know, as well, uh, speaking about, you know, Russian uh, talking heads <laughs> and, and, and public figures, um, uh, one of the strongest... Uh, non-Kremlin narrative, narratives is a uh, normalizing narrative and the, uh, you know, the gallant figure of this, uh, of this normalization is Ekaterina Schulman, uh, who, uh, she's an extremely successful political pundit, so she's uh, calling herself a political scientist, she actually hardly publishes anything. She's all the time on, uh, you know, on, on YouTube and what she's been doing for very many years, uh, long before the full-scale invasion started and long before she ended up uh, in exile, she's been normalizing everything. We are, we are just a country like any other country. We are just a, we are a society just like any other society. So this, uh, uh, there are two narratives uh, of you know, Russia being uh, very unique and Russia being uh, uh, totally normal. Uh, they par paradoxically coexist. And um, uh, speaking about, you know, uh, malign, uh, malign uh, um, manipu well, information manipulations uh, uh, coming from Russia. They are not necessarily, you, you know, intentional, uh, but some narratives that originate from uh, uh, in the opposition circles or in um, circles opposing uh, the Kremlin, not sympathetic with the Kremlin. Uh, Kremlin may be similarly dangerous. So this fixation, for example, uh, of uh, people like Navalny and uh, of the Russian opposition in general on corruption suggested that uh, this regime is driven uh, by financial interests, by material gain. This is their uh, objective. And it influenced the view of the regime uh, in the outside world uh, to, 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 to an enormous extent. So uh, this misconception of, of Putin as a pure kleptocrat who, who would never risk losing his ex assets uh, uh, was one of the reasons, you know, why all, uh, this crisis uh, uh, happened. 
and uh, we, we shouldn't underestimate the role of the uh, regime opponents in Russia. So they were endorsing this narrative uh, that they are uh, thieves, 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 uh, 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 and only thieves. And uh, corruption and uh, is the say is a different kind of economic interest. So you can uh, 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 you can govern in favor of your uh, economy, of your corporations, of your whatever, or you can govern in favor of your cronies. Uh, but this is the same type of government. And if you have your, uh, you know, if you are driven by ideas of domination, uh, if you are driven by imperial ideas, uh, if you are driven by stuff like that, it's totally different motivator. It's a totally different uh, uh, challenge, and you have to oppose it in a, in a totally different way. And this is one of the reasons why it was so difficult, you know, to break the big Russian narrative about, you know, there is a, a different Russia, we just have to uh, uh, um, uh, tread carefully uh, and uh, not to break, you know, our future uh, relationships and, uh, and business ties or whatever. Uh, and um, so you, if, th th there is certainly such thing as, you know, uh, disinformation coming from uh, government controlled or government inspired sources but the whole russian you know manipulative bubble has to be uh, has to be considered as a whole and unfortunately the uh, opposition uh, groups and opposition media are a part of this they provide also very important and correct insights in you know, investigative journalism and so on and so forth, but they also uh, endorse uh, you know, some narratives that are extremely dangerous and that are, uh, align themselves with, uh, with Kremlin narratives. Uh, because uh, there is the reason why uh, you know, the idea of the Ruski Mir, the, the, the Russian world, the uh, supremacist Russian idea, uh, there's a reason why it's based on, uh, you know, uh, skrepy, what, what Russians say, skrepy. Fixtures. Uh, Fixtures, yeah. yeah, yeah, basically. So uh, there's... So by the way. Yeah, um, there's several of them. There's uh, Russian church, Russian exceptionalism, Russian Ruska uh, Dusha, uh, Russian, uh, Russian militarism, Russian sportsman. Uh, great Russian history, and those are foundations. And space exploration, uh, uh, ignoring the, the great. Kind of, kind of. Yeah. Kinda. Uh, so uh, there is a reason why this uh, this idea is strategic in Russia, because uh, it doesn't matter uh, if, if you uh, follow the Russian agenda or you're oppositionist, but over time, when generations of people are raised on those ideas. Uh, they became basis for everyone, uh, people who support the, the Russian exceptionalism and supremacy and people who believe they are oppositionists. Uh, that's why they have to re-educate. But again, it's a big problem because, you know, uh, Russian regime in, in its different shapes and forms uh, over the years spent tremendous uh, resources on raising those generations of brainwashed people and uh, it uh, will be really hard to reverse this process unless we spend uh, approximately the same amount of resources and time. And this is an interesting point here because I think the commonality between the 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st century in Russia is that whoever you are, whether you're intelligentsia, uh, working class, whatever, you don't necessarily have any agency over your fate or if it's political agency you're talking about you have none at all have never had any and that that leads to all sorts of fantasies and divergence from reality and, and myth making now this isn't to say that people in the east of ukraine because they spoke russian were russian but this idea that organic politics wasn't real this idea that democracy isn't a real thing that wasn't totally absent in Ukraine either in 1991. There were a lot of people who didn't necessarily feel it, understand it, live it, or have experience of exercising political agency. How did that evolve from the point of independence? Now, 
you could say that the culture of freedom and volume was there, but to translate that into a belief in the power of democracy, that, that must have come over several years. How did that evolve and percolate out through the country? Um, I think that uh, it started around uh, 2004. Uh, around 2004 when Ukrainian people showed their incredible uh, skills in terms of self-organization. Uh, when the Orange Revolution began, uh, again it began with uh, uh, dictator Yanukovych forging the elections and those massive cases of, uh, you know, of uh, Falsified, you know, those uh, those uh, uh, election bulletins just dropped into the boxes uh, in packs, uh, which doesn't happen in like in, in the real life when they're dropped there one by one, but there are like packs of them inside of the boxes, and uh, uh, the regime uh, expected that people would just swallow that, you know, like. Uh, apparently, they uh, still thought that, you know, uh, Ukrainians are basically like Russians, they don't uh, protest much, uh, which was not the case, because uh, Ukraine, uh, I don't know, is it fortunately or, or unfortunately, but uh, Ukraine was uh, basically the, the cradle of, you know, protests since uh, early 20th century um, and, and centuries before. And uh, that's when Ukrainians uh, went on the streets and said, no, we, we, we're not buying that. Uh, we, we have to you know, cancel those uh, elections because this is what we see. It's not supposed to be like that. It's not the democracy. And that's, uh, that's in my memory for the first time when Ukrainians showed their self-organization uh, and uh, they showed that uh, they want to be a democratic society like the rest of the Europe. Um, so I think, uh, it, it's again, it's my personal opinion, but uh, early 2000s is when we saw this, um, uh, uh, the evolution towards democracy in Ukraine. And later, of course, it was uh, confirmed by the Revolution of Dignity. Um, and uh, again, the Revolution of Dignity showed this incredible self-organization uh, self of Ukrainians because, uh, again, those people who say that, you know, it was a coup, they don't realize that a coup is by, according to all kinds of vocabularies, right? Um, it's when uh, some power takes control over the country, uh, be it uh, religious organization or political organization, military, whatever. But uh, in the Revolution of Dignity, which is very important, hundreds and hundreds of non-government organizations and just common people took part uh, because they could not uh, you know, uh, stand the idea that uh, you know, some uh, pro-Russian dictator uh, will be turning our country into like fifth world country. You know, we wanted to be a democratic country and uh, I think uh, all Ukrainian people demonstrated th their will 100% uh, during their revolution. Nikolai. Yeah, well, um, I mean, uh, it, it, it would go probably too far if we would start discussing you know fundamental differences between the russian society and the ukrainian society but there are some fundamental differences indeed and they've always been there uh, like um, a russian society is extremely hierarchical and it's organized around hierarchies and people are trained to you know to understand finest nuances of who relates to whom how on this uh, uh, 3D hierarchical, you know, thing, and the Ukrainian society is in tendency uh, very egalitarian, um, uh, um, which is one of the basic differences. Uh, it was, it has never been totally suppressed under the Soviet rule, and. Um, if I may give you an example, an opposite example from Germany. If you look at the election maps, uh, you will realize that the uh, right-wing populist strongholds are the same, basically the same places that were uh, um, Nazi strongholds in the past, where they 
uh, gained their greatest successes before uh, the coup. <laughs> and uh, the population has completely changed and there is a, a huge proportion of migrants and uh, uh, internal migration and so far, uh, uh, so forth. But uh, there is this kind of, you know, institutional, institutional memory. What makes a city a city? What makes a country a country? And, 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 and this is what we are looking at here. Uh, it can manifest itself in different forms and in, in different circumstances, uh, but this is what, uh, uh, what actually happened here. And egalitarian does not necessarily mean uh, democratic, but this is easier, you, you know, to come from egalitarian to democratic than from strongly hierarchical to, uh, uh, to democratic. Like you've got the right elements yeah, in the yeah. right place, and, so and, it can and, 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 and this mm -hmm. is why this uh, this is why it is probably very problematic, you know, to just adopt uh, uh, adopt some um, methods uh, from Ukraine and try to implement them. Uh, in other places, <laughs> let's put it like that. Uh, I, I agree with Nikolai because uh, comparing to Russians who have this strict hierarchy, um, Ukrainians, uh, which is a like it's our feature, which is both good and bad, but uh, Ukrainians generally don't really like authorities. You know that's why we would rather live in some kind of uh, uh, anarchy. Okay. Uh, where uh, a bunch of small communities can cooperate between each other and collaborate and have trade and stuff, but uh, we will never, uh, you know, uh, uh, be commanded by some single person, which, uh, of course, we try to change over time, but it's, you know, some, some uh, kind of Ukrainian feature that uh, dates back centuries probably. And, uh, of course, uh, a lot of people may say, but, uh, b but this is chaos, you know. But on the other hand, this is democracy. This is exactly the processes every uh, democratic nation went through uh, back in the days, you know. So uh, I think Ukraine has a great potential as a democratic country, 100%. We'll take some comments in a minute, but this is an interesting point which has been made over and over. I spoke to Peter Pomerantsev just a couple of days ago, he made the same point, is that propaganda cannot invent a problem. It yeah. cannot start from scratch. So if you try to convince Ukrainians that statism is best, that sort of chaos is far more detrimental than some kind of oppressive order, you're not going to get very far because it just it's not an idea that, that that has deep roots really it's going to be almost rejected like a like an organ that's out of your body whereas and this is very very broadly speaking the idea of there being a sort of stateless chaos um, isn't just something that the russian regime imposes on the people against their will it's an idea that has a ready audience that is potentially keen to say, okay, well, no, chaos is terrible. I mean, I can see that Ukraine has developed some benefits here, but yeah, that kind of chaos wouldn't work here in Russia. I've heard many people say, yeah, it might work for them, but we'd all start killing each other if it happened here. Now, whether that's real or not, or whether that's kind of a historical mythology or propaganda, there, seem, there, there needs to be some kind of synthesis between the propagandist and the audience, otherwise it's not gonna work. Uh, I think Russians are uh, really deeply uh, afraid of chaos um, because it's a fundamental break of hierarchies um, and nothing works. And we also have the, uh, here a very um, different understanding on, of what freedom is. Yeah, freedom is just a word that can be filled with very uh, different meanings. And in case of Ukraine, it's most certainly uh, related uh, to dignity, and, and and this is not coincidence that the revolution of dignity is called that and not something else. And in 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 Russia, in this hierarchical uh, uh, society, which is actually accepted by everyone, it's it, it, it's very difficult to understand, even for advanced intellectuals. Uh, which we can see very often. Uh, so the idea of freedom uh, is generally 
for very, very many people, for the vast majority of people, is uh, related to the absence of limits and limitations and restrictions. And it might sound like a paradox, uh, but uh, Putin is actually seen by very many people as a liberator. Because, well, the hierarchy, it's, it's a natural uh, kind of state of of things. You can't liberate people from, you know, seasons or from rain or from things like that. But you can l liberate them from the necessity, you know, to stay at home. And you give them umbrellas or you give them cars and they can move around. And here uh, they can do whatever the fuck they want. They can go and murder if they want. Uh, uh, I mean, not to trivialise it, it sounds like the attempt to liberate the house elves in Harry Potter. They, they don't want to be liberated because even though you might live as a slave, you might live in, in some kind of fairly terrible conditions, you've got your orders, you've got, you know, you know who's above you, you know who's below you, you're not given any responsibility. Now, what role does this play? That freedom isn't just about unlimited uh, chaos, but it's about taking some kind of responsibility, making decisions for yourself, having agency. And it seems to me that the Ukrainian interpretation of freedom means taking action, doing something within society or politically or whatever. Freedom isn't just something abstract or passive. It has no meaning in that sense. Is this what terrifies Russians? The idea that freedom would put some kind of burden of responsibility on you as an individual? Um, Ukrainian idea of freedom was described by uh, Les Podravyansky uh, like very, very specifically fuck off from Ukraine, okay? Just, just let us be. Just do not interfere, okay? Uh, and which I think is a, is a beautiful idea and uh, uh, there's all, all kinds of, you know, um, uh, there, there's all kinds of uh, alliances and forces and yada yada, but Ukrainians always wanted to be like uh, masters of their own land, which we have in our anthem, right? Um, I, idea of freedom is when you leave the when you leave the way you want, and uh, generally people want to live prosperously, right? They they, they want uh, to have good well-being, they have, want to have wealth and things like that. It's normal. Uh, for Russians, it's different because Russians are taught, uh, again, uh, according to Dugin and Prilepin and uh, the, the general uh, Kremlin's agenda, they're taught that uh, you will never live prosperously like people on the West. But it's not your path. It's, it's, it's not your way. Your way is to live in poverty and suffer, but uh, you're suffering not just like some slaves or whatever, but you're suffering as good Christians, uh, Orthodox Christians that will definitely go to heaven uh, after you die. Uh, and uh, this is the idea. They, they see that, uh, for example, people in Ukraine, when Russian invaders uh, came to Bucha, they were shocked that uh, Ukrainians that were always described in the Russian media as, you know, the, the, like untermenschen, you know, uh, under, under like low level people, they live much better than people in Russia because they have like good apartments, cars, uh, clean streets, uh, no dog poop lying, you know, scattered uh, on the children playgrounds and stuff like that, uh, which, which is very typical for like every Russian children playground. But they were shocked that uh, Ukrainians have right to, to live better than Russians. And that's why they were so much furious. That's why we saw all those uh, washing machines and conditioners uh, snatched from Ukrainian apartments. apartments. I mean, when you speak to individuals uh, whose actual possessions have been defiled, you will find that the destruction isn't just from soldiers living in their apartments. It's wanton destruction, defecation on their possessions, absolute obscenities. It's, it's much deeper than just been, theft or whatever. It's been described as a widespread phenomenon during the Russian so-called revolution, the uh, Bolshevik uh, whatever, uh, revolt, and the civil war. 
um, there is also a tradition that, you know, uh, house break-ins uh, in Russia, especially in the countryside, uh, countryside, it happens very often. That, they, also, they, 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 I mean, that was a real problem. People just having their houses burnt down in the countryside for no good reason, just... Yeah, but the, the, this is what happens when, uh, when there are break-ins in Russia. So they don't even uh, only go into, into your house to steal your, you know, things. Um, they vandalize it and um, n not to cover the tracks but for the sake of it and um, uh, there is an anecdote that I like very much um, it's from the early 2000s there was a, a Russian big Russian agricultural holding that bought a huge chunk of land in the one of the black soil regions uh, well, there was unemployment and all sorts of, you know, depression, post-Soviet depression, and they thought, oh, okay, we come uh, uh, to, to, to this region, we provide, we, we give jobs, we, we, we give uh, people good conditions, actually, uh, uh, um, and nothing worked. There was a lot of sabotage on, uh, on machinery, they could not recruit um, uh, uh, recruit uh, local workers, they imported, brought uh, workers from other regions, they were attacked by the locals and they were, uh, they were totally, uh, uh, totally confused and then they commissioned a sociological service, a really big ones, uh, and the objective was to find the motivators. Uh, what can we do to, uh, 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 to make this thing work? And the results were uh, were actually stunning. So people didn't were not really interested in uh, a high standard of life. They were not interested in uh, having you know running water, water closets, uh, washing machines, whatever. Well, they didn't object that, but they were not really motivated by that. The only motivator. Uh, uh, and th this, uh, uh, this survey is available online, <laughs> this is very interesting. Uh, the only motivator um, was uh, that uh, the neighbor does not live better than me. And there were some recommendations and um, 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 how to uh, to make this thing work, and it was a kind of you, you, you know semi uh, colhos with a, uh, a strong uh, authority. Uh, oh, and, and they tried all kind of uh, of financial motivators, you, you know, bone and and things like that. Nothing worked, and then there was you know strong mutual control and uh, uh, firm leadership, and the, the holding is thriving. So this is uh, this is hard sociology, uh, and hard sociology kind of uh, checked uh, by uh, by economy. And, and it's a pure form of, of almost jealousy. It's like you, you get told what to do, but your your fellow people need to be on the same level as you, not given any privilege. So this isn't about rights. This isn't about freedom, it's about privilege. It seems to be the, the, the pure interpretation, where you are in the system and what privilege you attain. Yeah, but this, is, but this has to do with hierarchies. Because, uh, you know, if you are on the same level, you have to, uh, 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 you, you, you have to live you know, in a similar way. What do you think? You are better? Yeah, this is, this is a typical reaction. So when people start, you know, it's it's especially uh, uh, bad in the countryside when where people are, you, you know, closely uh, connected to each other, who know each other well, and uh, the, the, where there is no anonymity of big cities. So that, why is he doing this? D d does he think, or do they think they are better than us? To pick up on you said, uh, um, OS. This idea that, yes, you've got the Orthodox Church, etc., etc., but isn't there more to it than that? It's not that you've got the Orthodox Church and it's good. You've got the Orthodox Church and it's better than somebody else's church. You might live in poverty, but that doesn't matter because you're part of a great country. Isn't this an essential part of 
keeping people quiet is to say, you know, this imaginary thing we're going to tell you, you're, you're great because you're part of this. You might not feel it, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, absolutely. And it works, unfortunately. I remember uh, several years ago there was this uh, Russian uh, comedian, uh, Zadornov, uh, who became uh, famous in Russia because, uh, so first of all, he was like, uh, genuine Russian Nazi, okay, like Russian supremacist, and uh, every stand-up he would start uh, with the words, Americans are stupid, okay, uh, first time he was banned from entering America after that, uh, and then he started like saying that, like generally, uh, uh, like as if he was talking about people of the West, oh, right? Stupid. That's okay. Yeah, that and, and uh, he was uh, he had like a lot of stand-ups that would would portray Russians in different uh, funny and stupid situations. All those situ situations were extremely stupid. Okay, but uh, at the same time he would uh, make people proud. Like, look, yes, we are stupid, we are ridiculous, but this is what makes us great nation, the strongest in the world. And uh, you know, whenever I see. Uh, uh, you know, like Russian comedian bloggers, for example, on a YouTube wearing shapka ushankas mm -hmm. and like drinking vodka and thinking that in 2024, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it looks funny. I feel uh, like really, really uh, sorry for those people that they still live like in, in the previous world. Uh, it, it, like it, it's a really hard topic, but uh, yeah. Uh, Things like uh, church, things like sportsmen, things like uh, army, uh, all this is used as uh, foundations of this uh, ideology of Ruski Mir that makes people think that they are chosen and they have this deep connection with cosmos and nature and yada yada and, and the God, of course. Um, and uh, the problem is, like comparing to other nations, yeah, it's normal to be a patriot of your country. But at the same time, you you should not hate other countries. Russians uh, percept all like all the NATO is Nazi. Okay, it's like as if uh, Russia is the only anti-fascist uh, country in the world, and then there's NATO, which consists of multiple Nazi nations that combined. Uh, a dream of destroying this uh, beautiful uh, Russian na uh, nation, which is uh, like it raises several questions, right? Uh, is it so? Mm -hmm. And then you see, uh, I don't know if you've watched the 1420 channel where interviews are done on the street and something that comes up over and over again. It's a certain generation, typically, it's the older generation, and they just say, Nas they're, they're envious of us, which of course sounds ridiculous, but actually putting yourselves in their position, they don't have any frame of reference. Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned Zadornov because there was an, uh, a, a very remarkable evolution of this stand-up. Because originally it was a parody of, uh, uh, you know, of backward Russians. So it was some Russian idiot uh, who did stupid things and uh, kept saying Americans are, uh, are idiots. Uh, very, very soon it became sincere. Uh, so it didn't last. But yeah, uh, this is also very interesting that you mentioned this, um, you know, connection to to cosmos or uh, to something for uh, for the for the Russians. It, 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 it is a big question: what a person means uh, when the person says, "I'm Russian." What does it actually mean being a Russian? It's not, we know, it's not the language. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, it's not a territory, uh, because as we know, Russia is borderless, and this uh, uh, feeling of borderlessness is an essential part of this. Uh, uh, self-identification or I don't know, I don't even know how to, to put it correctly. And then um, there is this uh, intrinsic, uh, very deep uh, uh, connection uh, of this self-esteem uh, with natural resources. So as if the power of the earth, power of the nature, 
uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, oil or animals in the forest, they go directly into you. Um, so you are not a part of, uh, a, of a people, you are part of a natural force. And this makes you so unique and so superior. And other people, those idiots, they have to work for their prosperity. We are prosperous and uh, well off by nature. This is what makes us unique and this is uh, how this territory is uh, connected and, and, and expansion and the necessity to expand is connected to, to, understand, to, to, to the identity, uh, if we put it in you know, modern uh, uh, terms. And for, for Ukraine it's obviously completely different. This is uh, a people on its earth. In its land, and this is how. Uh, by the way, I'm I'm I'm, I'm Crimean, and it's uh, it's always been uh, well, always it's been a long and painful, um, you know, history of uh, uh, mutual uh, uh, misunderstanding. And uh, Crimea had a lot of difficulties to you know embrace Ukraine, and Ukraine had a lot of difficulties to embrace Crimea and then with Crimean Tatars actually this uh, this happened because well for, for the uh, collective you know for, for the Ukrainian civic nation uh, and, and and this type of identity it's 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 perfectly understandable this is the people on its uh, in its land in, in, in their land uh, the Crimean Tatars don't have any other uh, a homeland and they don't need any other uh, a homeland and this makes Crimea kind of understandable and every you know uh, pro you this is a stupid term I guess if you are a Ukrainian how can you be pro Ukrainian but you know every Crimean who has this sense of civic U Ukrainian civic identity I would think is extremely sympathetic uh, with the Crimean Tatar cause. Uh, this is what makes us Crimeans in this modern, you know, Ukrainian uh, uh, sense and not in the Russian imperial, uh, imperial sense. And that takes us back to propaganda because unfortunately propaganda is effective uh, in some levels. It's multi-layered and you hear many people saying, ah, well, Russian propaganda is, is simplistic and stupid. I don't fall for it. All that means is you've spotted something you identify as Russian propaganda, but there's a whole load of other stuff which you haven't identified as propaganda, which may be still influencing your thoughts and your behaviors. And Crimea is a, is a classic example of that because clearly it wasn't always Russian. Uh, clearly over history uh, there's been a process of colonization and displacement of the, the native population and yet the narrative that Crimea is not part of Ukraine and the majority uh, Russian speak and therefore you know by default are part of the Russian uh, Empire that unfortunately does percolate through and you still see that narrative amplified and repeated in the media. Yeah. And I'm picking up on one of the questions we've got uh, from the audience here is why is the media so inept at calling out some Russian propaganda narratives? Someone gave a, a classic example here, which is that every time Medvedev has one of his brain farts, um, it is reported almost verbatim in the Italian newspapers, is the example here. But let's not just pick on Italy, because you get the BBC, you get Western press, even in a country like Britain, which is fully squarely behind uh, Ukraine, you still get absolutely inept uh, headlines, and sometimes you get actual sort of repetition or echoing of Russian propaganda narratives. Why are we still so bad at this? Oh, yes. uh, the problem is, uh, which is not really a problem uh, if we're talking about the democratic society, but people on the West, they were uh, raised with the understanding that uh, they must accept the like different points of view whenever you have a discussion which is like basis of uh, democracy there are people with different opinions but they can find some 
some uh, common solution, right? Some common idea. And uh, people on the West realize that uh, when you hear some kind of narrative, you, you, you try to like understand the, like the second party, right? You're trying to uh, walk their boots, okay? Uh, and uh, Russia uses this to basically destroy democracy uh, uh, in, the, in the Western democracies uh, because they go buy a labs in Ukraine. Okay, or uh, or genetically modified locust. Uh, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm not, it's like, a uh, genetically yeah, modified locust that was brought by Americans to Donbass to destroy the Donbass Donbassian um, crops, and uh, of course people they think like yeah, majority of people go well, it's a bullshit. Are you kidding? And they show some kind of, you know, some kind of basement where, uh, like, uh, those deathly viruses were uh, created by American uh, military uh, scientists. And they go, well, in this basement, they created, like, viruses that were spread by birds and mosquitoes. And uh, you go, this is bullshit. When you take a look at uh, facilities where... Yeah, where, where real scientists produce uh, combat, uh, you know, biological weapons, it's like they, they look absolutely different. They have like multiple layers of defense. They're like big structures with filters, with filtration stations and guards and everything. Not, nothing like that. Uh, but there are people who think, what if it's true? And, and this is why Russian propaganda is, is so dangerous, because when you think, but why, why if it's, what if it's true, then you start finding logical explanation why it can be true, you know, like uh, when you go and check Russian uh, um, resources dedicated to flat earth, okay, they're the most convincing ones, trust me. I saw a lot of them, but, <laughs> but uh, w when you watch the Russian channels, you, you go, oh my God, We've been lied all this time, you know, uh, because uh, because they know how to do it and uh, they know how to influence Western minds. Because Western people, they are open to hear the the thoughts of of the uh, you know of the opponents. And uh, one thing people must understand that uh, Russia created propaganda. Russia is efficient with propaganda. Russia has no freedom of speech. Russia has no freedom of press. That's why, uh, what is even the point in uh, listening to Russian propaganda if their media are so much biased? They give you 10% of information, like Ukraine, uh, there, there's a corruption in Ukraine. Yeah, there's a cor corruption in Ukraine, but the rest 90% of information will be like uh, Zelensky bought two yachts, uh, Zelensky bought uh, like three castles, uh, which were like debunked like 100 times. Um, and people, they, uh, they get lost, they get confused. Uh, so one of the things is to accept the fact that Russia is lying. And for those people who think that, but everybody is like, no, you, you have not been to Russia where you have absolutely no freedom of speech and thought. If you stand uh, for 10 minutes outside somewhere with an empty banner, you're done. Yeah. Uh, it, Russia's not trying to target people like me and you who are going to say, hang on a second, I smell BS here. They're not going to waste their money on those people. So this is almost like a, it's like a marketing campaign. You're going to say, okay, which of our target audience is more susceptible? What are they susceptible to? Let's try that out. But also, I mean, this could be an interesting scientific study. If you want to actually convince someone to believe in something, that's at the top end of your cost scale. That's really difficult. But if you can convince them to say, well, it might be true or it might not, that's a lot cheaper and a lot less effort to get them to that point, and that might achieve your ends. The other one is, you know, from it might be true, it might not. The flip side of that, and I still hear this, I've heard this from a lot of um, refugees, actually, that I've spoken to, because we, we, we've helped out. If you can even get them to say, we'll never know. The world is more complex. We'll never know. It's not my place in life. You've already won. Propaganda's won with relatively minimal effort, actually. Yeah, absolutely. They're using this um, idea of, you know, implanting and growing cynicism in people. So people start questioning facts and they go, 
uh, we will never know the truth. The truth is too complicated. Uh, we must, uh, you know, listen to both sides. Ukraine, uh, which might be wrong and might be right, and Russia, which might be wrong and might be right. And uh, basically, when when you show them the results of Russian atrocities and them destroying cities and killing people and raping women and children in, in Bucha, in European, uh, they go, but everybody does that, you know. People are growing with this san uh, sense of cynicism, which is, again, it's, it's very, very uh, dangerous. This is the Tucker Carlson line, isn't it? Which, Basically, to me, yeah. pegs him as a propagandist, oh. not a journalist. That's a classic line right there. Yeah, but this is, yeah uh, well, w w a great part of the problem is that our Western, uh, and I'm speaking now as a, as a, as a German citizen and, and resident, uh, that our uh, political elites and our media elites have lost the sense of truth. And our society was virtually corrupted by that. Uh, so there is this, you know, general idea now that we, pro what, 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 that uh, you know, wrong politics uh, towards Putin have encouraged them. We've been sending uh, wrong signals to Moscow or to Peking, for that sake. But we were also sending the same signals uh, into our own society. And what we see is that people who are responsible for the worst political decisions and who are dangerously close to big-scale corruption, we don't know if they were involved or not, because there were no uh, parliamentary hearings, for example. Um, uh, those people that no responsibility, like people like our federal president, uh, who was not invited uh, um, uh, to, uh, to hearings, he was elected to represent to be the um, uh, the figure of uh, of respect, the the ultimate figure of respect for this country, and this is uh, what we are doing to us. Uh, uh, one of the first, uh, uh, well, uh, when, when, when the annexation of Crimea happened, there was a lot of debate in Germany and there were uh, obviously a lot of people who said, oh yeah, Crimea was always Russian, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, our former chancellor, uh, Helmut Schmidt, came. And he was already 90-something, an elder statesman, uh, but a very respected uh, uh, figure and not, uh, you know, noticed in being uh, 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 not uh, on the top of his. And he said in an interview, oh, you know, Ukraine is even not a nation. Uh, to hear something like that from a former Wehrmacht officer is a, is a really big thing. But it was not Russian propaganda. Russian propaganda fills gaps. And this is not the, the responsibility, you know, of a civil society or of whoever to, uh, to debunk it, to, uh, to confront it. We do what we can. We do it uh, in the media. We do it as, uh, you know, independent actors. We do it as part of, uh, you know, research programs and civil society organizations. But what we actually need is a combined effort of uh, states, of governments, governmental, uh, uh, um, governmental actions in Germany uh, or in other Western countries against, well, let, let's call it bullshit, against bullshit. But we also need massive uh, Ukrainian information campaigns because, uh, you know, nobody else can do this. We'll uh, come to that in a minute because this is a very interesting idea, how Ukraine which is on the front line. I almost think of it like, uh, you know, if, if you're talking about a, um, almost a biological sense, an immune system against disinformation, Ukraine is like the, the bats in the cave. You know, you need a fearsome uh, immune system because the, uh, it's so much more of a toxic atmosphere in terms of the virology of it. We'll come to that one in a minute because I think that's interesting. But to touch on the idea of lies, there are gradations of lies, aren't there? I mean, propaganda will often deal with the sort of the small 
sometimes seemingly insignificant lie, but sometimes it'll tell the big lie in almost, you know, I, I dare not almost mention the name here, but Goebbels, the bigger the lie, the more convincingly you tell it, the more passion you put into it, that lie is going to succeed. And you mentioned the one there, that Ukraine is not a nation. I mean, that is a lie so monstrous and so big and so clearly challenged by reality. And yet we see these big monstrous lies go unchallenged. Hmm. So I've stunned the audience into yeah, silence uh, with that I, one. I, I, I don't know if the word lie is, uh, is, is correct here. It's, it's, it's framing. You can uh, tell lots of lies about Ukraine, sure, and big lies, they actually don't last. But the framing stays, and this is way more di uh, difficult to you know, resist the framing and break the framing than to debunk, uh, debunk certain lies. Uh, Let's turn to Ukrainian media, because that's a question that's been asked uh, by a member of the audience. What should we be learning from the Ukrainian media uh, in the process of tackling disinformation? And of course, Ukraine is, and the Ukrainian population is subject to a huge barrage of, of this disinformation and propaganda that has been for a considerable period of time. So what have they learned? What do they do well? What do they not do so well? Uh, so I would say that uh, one of the most unifying factors, uh, I mean, in terms of unification of our people uh, and uh, making them less susceptible to the, to the Russian propaganda, was the Russian invasion, unfortunately. Because uh, before it happened, uh, even though uh, we had war since 2014, but uh, we had plenty of pro-Russian movements, we had plenty of different uh, parties and political movements opposing each other, uh, and uh, we could never have uh, any sort of unity, you know. Uh, which on one hand, it's, it's a normal thing, but on the other hand, uh, personally, I was afraid that uh, eventually, you know, Ukraine will completely lost any uh, we will completely lose any uh, sort of uh, like same direction and uh, we would just end up having a civil war. Uh, but uh, after the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine, uh, people united and uh, apparently some kind of shocking event like this, uh, the threat of physical death uh, of you or your kids, uh, I think it played huge role, um, but uh, of course we, we nowadays we have huge uh, experience in uh, fighting Russian propaganda. We are fighting it on the state level using the center of uh, countering the uh, misinformation. Right, uh, it's a department within the, the Council for Security and Defense of Ukraine. Uh, we have also a lot of. Uh, again, because people in Ukraine uh, so much like to self-organize, uh, we have plenty of uh, voluntary organizations and NGOs that uh, do fact-checking, that do um, f f myth debunking and things like that. And those people are partisans in this information war, but we need armies, we need state actors. Absolutely. Like, I, I completely agree with Nikolai because uh, we have to have some kind of legal solution of fighting the Russian, uh, not only Russian, also Chinese, Iranian propaganda on the state level, uh, on the level of governments and all, on the level of international governments like the EU, because uh, we have to develop uh, a mechanism of uh, countering propaganda aimed at destroying democracies be before it's too late because it's basically already uh, late, uh, yeah, uh, but... Uh, uh, as far as, uh, as the military is concerned, everybody understands that, uh, you know, the resources have to be comparable. You can't, you know, fight uh, uh, with handguns uh, against uh, cruise missiles. And you have to spend a comparable amount of resources and a comparable amount of money. Uh, on the other hand, and everybody agrees that we have uh, 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 um, to do with the information warfare, but we don't uh, spend o almost any 
resources on that. This is, well, Russia spends billions uh, on propaganda, disinformation and whatever. And this, uh, this is built into, you know, entertainment products. Uh, you, you don't recognize it uh, uh, as propaganda uh, um, on the first sight. You, 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 you get infected through, you know, popular uh, songs and uh, uh, TV entertainment and whatever. And, um, uh, and on, on the European side, we have like millions? Hmm. Seriously? And, um, and, when, and we don't, I, 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 in, in my humble opinion, we don't have to think uh, in terms of propaganda. We, uh, we have to uh, we have to do information campaigns, we have to promote and endorse our uh, uh, vision of things, of the world, uh, our framing uh, of certain um, things, uh, political events, of history, or whatever. And this requires money. We have to, uh, uh, you know, we need more uh, Ukrainian literature being translated and promoted uh, uh, and we need you know grants for this let's turn to, to uh, uh, something which is a difficult and possibly unpopular topic as well um ukraine wasn't necessarily brilliant at tackling russian disinformation for the first eight years of the war in fact in the east mm -hmm. uh, quite slow to respond and realize that the challenge and threat from it um but when the full-scale war came they made a concerted effort to um, exclude oligarchs from media ownership and involvement. Whereas if you compare that to the West, you've got one of the world's largest communication platforms, um, Twitter, or X as it's been disastrously branded, owned by an oligarch with commercial interests, with relationships with so-called powers which are part of the autocratic um, alliance of evil or whatever, clear you know, connections with China, etc., and requirement on resources from that country uh, for his industries and wealth, um, who is openly amplifying and spouting Kremlin narratives. So one of the problems must be that we have no appetite to tackle that elephant in the room, which is oligarch involvement in means of mass communication. Sorry, big challenging topic there. Uh, Independent media is something that we all need, of course. Uh, maybe uh, we should, uh, again, develop some kind of legal mechanism to make people owning channels, uh, owning media, responsible for spreading misinformation. Because currently, as far as I remember, uh, Twitter is leading platform in terms of uh, amount of fake accounts uh, that are used to spread all kinds of narratives, uh, including Russian narratives. So probably we have to have some kind of uh, solution. On Twitter there is this thing when, uh, for example, when you make a publication there's uh, community notes that can say, dude, you're wrong because you know th this is not true. And uh, people who find it useful, they can agree and, and promote those community notes. It, they work. And maybe uh, we, can find, uh, we, we can have something like that uh, in other media as well. Uh, so people would understand that uh, they are they're legit. Okay? But how it's going to work, this is what we should think about. Because uh, fighting misinformation is not just fighting lies. It's uh, fighting, it, it's participating in the hybrid warfare and people must realize that yeah, yeah. Th that, uh, inform that propaganda and misinformation is a combat weapon because uh, hybrid warfare has uh, a clear combat goals, ge geopolitical strategical goals that, uh, for example, Putin wants to reach. And uh, that's why they must understand that uh, propaganda coming from Russia is a combat weapon that kills. Uh, and uh, apparently, uh, you know, we will come to this understanding somehow that 
uh, we need to have governments involved into this because Russian propaganda is uh, promoted and pushed by the state, right? It's, it's a state apparatus. So maybe we should also uh, define some kind of uh, measures by other states and governments to counter this. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, in the Cold War, they had, we, uh, well, the West started institutions like you know, Voice of America, Radio Liberty, and they were adequate to, to the situation because... BBC World Service again, I know a lot of yeah, people BBC listen World to that Service, the Iron Exactly. Yeah. Now they are uh, dinosaurs. Uh, they may be good media, maybe less good media, but they are dinosaurs. We can't combat uh, this confusion just with some resource telling, uh, telling the truth. It doesn't work like this. Uh, it, uh, going back to the Russian opposition, they had this great delusion, you know, that uh, you tell the people the truth and the uh, regime falls. Nothing like that happened. So um, we need resources and they, they, they have to be state resources. And we're back to fighting a regime which is murderous but which also relies on uh, an informational ecosystem. So I think the, the example of NAFO is a good one. A lot of NAFO people who, uh, and for those who don't know that, that's a sort of digital collective, a chaotic digital collective online that seeks to find Russian bullshit and, and basically dump on it with humor and memes and so on. Um, and it's easy to get disheartened thinking that, that you know, we're not having much of an effect, but one of the recommendations of what, what my guests have recommended is that even one guy who's in Moscow doing this, taking, taking a risk, he said that the, when he gets depressed, the, the only thing that helps is to take action, not to sit there and pick at your scabs and get depressed. Taking some form of action is the, the best uh, salve for that and the best thing you can do to fight disinformation. So this is kind of an interesting thing because you may be sitting on your sofa screaming at the at your computer screen typing in you know maga blah 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 or libtards or whatever you may be sort of screaming at the opposition thinking you're doing something to counter propaganda all you're doing is adding to propaganda's intent which is to get you all to scream at each other and not find common ground and unite so i'd, I'd love to hear your, your views on that one uh I would say this, 100% uh, uh, if you're actively involved into something, it, it helps you big time against depression and, and uh, demotivation. But, uh, you know, we started talking about uh, losing informational warfare. Uh, I would also like uh, to say uh, an opposite thing. People in the West, which were the reason I created my channel on YouTube, uh, they impressed me so much uh, with their decency and their support to Ukraine. Because, you know, globally people have to train to become good people, right? We're, we're all born selfish and evil. It's a truth. Right. When you look at the kids playing in, in, in the, you know, uh, the kids playground and they beat each other like they want to steal the toys and, and you know, yeah, this is what we are from the beginning. But we have to learn how to be better people and uh, people on the West, uh, they they surprised me with this, uh, th that they're friendly, they're open, they uh, have sympathy towards Ukrainians, they feel our pain, that's why they want to help. Uh, and uh, Russian propaganda is uh, directed, uh, m it is directed on those people, but to the less, uh, smaller extent. Uh, but uh, still its task is to make the number of people that are basically, they didn't learn anything, bigger and, and more influential than them. But uh, the positive note of, uh, you know, today's program would be this. Uh, people, we were wrong about people on the West. They are fantastic and decent and open. And uh, the reason why they will win and why we will win against the 
Russian terrorism is because uh, they are more active, they can fight for their ideas, while uh, people who support Russian terrorism, they are driven by feelings like hate, laziness and greed. And despair as well. Yeah. Despair works too. Nikolai. Uh, this is all very optimistic, yeah. I, uh, um, I have my, you know, statistic ideas um, that I think, um, yeah, all this is very, uh, very important as a volunteer movement is very important in w what is makes up, what makes up a society, what makes Ukraine, Ukraine is this uh, great amount of solidarity and the involvement of, you know, uh, very many people from very different walks of life into uh, a direct war effort in, in very many different ways. But this is the army that fights the war. Uh, and one without the charter that, that doesn't make uh, very much sense. And this is what we need uh, on the information uh, battlefield. Uh, we need uh, state powers, uh, democracies, uh, to take action and this is where the volunteers and partisans uh, would play a crucial role. The state doesn't have to do everything, but it has to create the framework. We, uh, you can't block Russian resources. Uh, the government can. You can't arrest, uh, you know, uh, bank accounts, the government can, you can't uh, go after people who spread malicious uh, uh, narratives, the government can, but you can detect these people, you can uh, debunk uh, lies, you can, uh, you, you can do what you, what you do in a brilliant fashion, but <laughs> you, you, can't, you, you can't do the government's job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, and, 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 and one of our uh, tasks as a, you know, as citizens, as a civil society, as uh, academia, as whoever, as independent uh, actors, is to, uh, uh, to direct demands. We have to formulate them. We, just, we, we can't just sit and expect some uh, clever guy at the top to figure out what, what is best. We, but we have to communicate this. Right? Yeah, please do this and that. Well, this is going to be the last question because I think we're almost out of time and I'll, I'll start with you, Nikolai, and then we'll have um, operators to ask you sort of close with a final comment on this. And let's get to the point where Ukraine is victorious. How important is it for us to learn these lessons on information warfare as it currently exists, but also carry on innovating? Because even when Ukraine is victorious, the informational attack is definitely not going to end. It's not going to stop evolving. The intensity is not going to reduce. It may even increase. So how important is it for us to carry on innovating, learning, sharing, and as you say, perhaps working with government more closely to tackle? Yeah, we have identified actually the threat and we have to, uh, we have to act accordingly. And as we know, the, uh, well, what what does it really mean uh, uh, when or if Ukra Ukraine is victorious? When the, all the territories are liberated, uh, it's not necessarily the end. Uh, yeah, they can shell uh, liberated territories or do any uh, uh, any other uh, bad stuff. So we have to uh, confront all the threats. Uh, um, including information threats. Th 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 that's it. And we, we have to invest like really a lot of resources because it's not only the threat that's uh, coming from Russia, this is the uh, internal threats and this is what actually fundamentally endangers uh, liberal democracy, the good old <laughs> liberal democracy. I completely agree and uh, I can only say that uh, I believe that this uh, mechanism should be implemented uh, not only on the level of governments but 
above the level of governments, uh, on the level of, for example, United Nations, because uh, there will always be cases of propaganda coming from uh, different uh, parties, governments themselves. So we have to have control over our governments as, you know, as democratic and free people. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, rivalry is not bad generally. But uh, rivalry should exist in the form of friendly competition anywhere, in, in business, in life, in political uh, you know, uh, clashes. It must exist as friendly competition. It should not uh, be threat to your uh, life, to your freedoms, uh, which exactly what Russia wants. And uh, we should always remember that. Well, this has been a fantastic panel. I'm very grateful to my two guests here and to everybody that's taken part in this marathon session. Please do, before you check out, uh, make sure you scan the QR code, copy the link for donations. We don't want to just make this a day about information. We want people to take action and support Ukrainian victory by donating to help the armed forces. As Nikolai says, there's no point in fighting information unless you also fight the military battle and ensure the army is equipped and can fight back against Russian aggression that is happening every hour of every day in Ukraine. But thank you for staying with Ukraine. Thank you for staying with these issues. And we hope you carry on following all the channels of the people who have participated today.